So we already saw a little bit about inflection points and that an inflection point is where a graph changes its concavity. So sometimes you have a graph that is concave up. Concave up looks like that. Sometimes you have a graph that's concave down. Concave down looks like that. And if you put them together, that point right there is an inflection point where it changes from being concave up to concave down. So what does that mean? A couple of things. Here we've got, we have it concave up if its curve lies above all of its tangents in the interval and concave down if its curve lies below all of its tangents in the interval. What we can do in this case is look at this graph that we have right here. And we're going to label everything that's concave up, I'm going to draw in blue. And everything that's concave down, I'm going to draw in red. So again, concave up, you can think of something being happy. And concave down, there we go. Something being sad. So there we've got concave up and concave down. So for the blue part, this section is concave up. This section is concave up. This section is concave up. And these sections here, the concavity would be concave down. And on that graph, where it changes concavity, so where it changes from blue to red, we call those inflection points. So we're going to find out how do you find inflection points, how can you use those to help you graph things today. So we can use the second derivative to find our concavity. So this is what it will look like. The second derivative is just the derivative of the derivative. Does that make sense? So you've got your function, f of x, then you've got your derivative, f prime of x, and then you've got your second derivative, which is just one derivative past your first derivative. So let's say we had a graph, our first graph was an x cubed graph. That looks like this. If you took the derivative of an x cubed graph, what kind of graph would you get? An x squared graph. And if you took the derivative of an x squared graph, what kind of graph would you get? A line. Okay. Now, what did we find out from our first derivative? Our first derivative told us where our graph was increasing and where our graph was decreasing. So if I would draw axes on here, if I would draw my x and y axes, maybe it would look like this. And the reason it would look like this is because this point and this point correspond to those two points. Our maximums and our minimums, we learned that when we took the derivative, that's where the slope of our tangent would be zero. And then we did whatever these two points were, we did those as test points with our first derivative test to find out where things were increasing and where things were decreasing. Can you see that our function is increasing before this point, then decreasing after, and finally increasing in the end? Yes? So that's what our first derivative would tell us. Now, if we just went from this parabola to this line, and I drew my axis on here, I would get that this minimum point would correspond with that zero right there. And because this part is negative, it would be going my going one back, and you see that this one's going down and then going up after.
But when you go back two graphs, so if I take this point all the way back two graphs, it tells me something else. It tells me that that is the point where we're going to have an inflection point. And the fact that this part is negative here tells me that this section of my graph is concave down. And the fact that this part here is positive will tell me this section of my graph is concave up. So those are the big ideas, and now we're going to apply those to a bunch of questions. But when we do our first derivative and then our second derivative, we're going to find out about our concavity. So what I have here is if I notice, okay, if I notice if the slopes of the tangent lines are increasing, so here I've got my slope being 0.24, then 1.07, finally 4.05. If my tangents are increasing, I'm always going to have something that's concave up. Where do I see my tangents increasing? Well, always in this section here. There I have a negative slope. Then my slope is zero. Then my slope is positive. So if my tangent values are increasing, that only happens when something is concave up. How do we see that in these three graphs? If I want to find out where my tangent graph, right? This is my tangent graph, the second one. If I want to find out where it's increasing, that's in this part here is where it's increasing. So if I go to my next derivative and find out where it's positive, then I'm going to be able to tell that it's going to be concave up. Similarly, if my tangent lines are decreasing, in other words, if my tangent graph is going down, whenever that happens, go back to this graph, if my slopes get less, you can see those three red lines, the slopes are flattening out. So the value of the slope is getting less. You're always going to have something that's concave down. And so wherever your second derivative is negative, your original function will be concave down. So the simple summary of all this is that if your second derivative is positive, your original function was concave up. And if your second derivative is negative, your original function is concave down. And this is just that explanation. Here, if your second derivative is positive, greater than 0, then your original function is concave up. Here, if your second derivative is negative, then you know that it's concave down. And you get a point of inflection if two things happen. First of all, in order for it to be a point of inflection, one, you have to have your second derivative equal to zero. And then two, you need to show that it changes from positive to negative. In other words, it changes concavity at that point. So if those two things happen, then you know that it's an inflection point. So this is that note. You can't just show that it's equal to 0. You have to show that it changes concavity. The other thing that can happen there, so here we talked about it having to change concavity at that point, or you could also show that the first derivative does not change sign at that point. So we'll look at that example as well. So in order to show something's an inflection point, you have to show 
number one, f prime is equal to zero. And for number two, you have a choice. You can either show it changes concavity or number two that your first derivative doesn't change its sign at that point. So those are your two options. And we'll look at some specific examples and what each of those two options mean in a second. Okay. Here's example. We can graph example. I think we already have graphed this one. No, maybe not. We can look at all of the stuff that we can do for graphing, and we can show that it has a point of inflection at this point. So first of all, we'll solve this just as the question, and then as a second part, we'll graph it just to see how the inflection points can help us graph. So if you want to find an inflection point, you need to show two things. You need to show that the second derivative is equal to zero at that point. Well, how do you do that? You have to find your first derivative first. So I'll be 4x cubed minus 12x squared. And then you're going to need to find your second derivative, which will be 12x squared minus 24x. In order to find out that it is an inflection point, you're going to set your second derivative equal to 0 and solve. So this one we can factor out a 12x. So you get x equals 0 and x equals 2 as possibilities for inflection points. We draw the same sign diagram that we did before with our first derivative test. Put 0 and 2 into that. And then we check if things are positive or negative. If something's positive, we know our graph was concave up. If something is negative, we know our graph is concave down. So plug a number. And again, I plug things into our factored form because it's going to be easiest to tell if things are positive or negative. Plug a number less than 0 in. Can you see that 12 times negative 1 would be a negative number? And negative 1 minus 2 would be a negative number. And a negative times a negative would be positive. So here we have something being concave up. If you tried something between 0 and 2, like 1, this will be positive. The second uh, factor would still be negative. And a positive times a negative be negative. This part is concave down. And finally, if you tried something larger than 2, this is positive. This would also be positive. So now we can write a statement. And this is the first way you could say, since f double prime at 2 equals 0 and f of x changes from concave down to concave up, at x equals 2, we know Two comma, and we can find out what that point is exactly by plugging 2 into our original equation. 2 to the 4 is 16. Minus 32 will be 2 comma negative 16. So we know that it is an inflection point. So in order to show something at an inflection point, you need to show two things. One, that the second derivative is equal to 0 at that point. And secondly, that it changes concavity. That's option number one. 
option number two, which we listed here before, right? We did option number one where it changes concavity. Option number two, we could have just shown that the first derivative doesn't change sign at that point. So what does that look like for our question? Well, in order to find stuff out about our first derivative, we would set this equal to zero to see if we have any stationary points. We can factor out a 4x squared here, leaving us with x minus 3. Tells us that x is equal to 0 or x is equal to 3 as our possible stationary points. And if we did our sine diagram here with 0 and 3, this would tell us where our original function was increasing and decreasing. So what happens? Well, before 0, this is always going to be positive. This will be negative. So we know that our function is decreasing here. Between 0 and 3, this is still going to be negative. So it's still decreasing. And then after 3, they'll both be positive. So it's increasing afterwards. So if we wanted to use the second explanation, we could have written the following. Since f double prime of 2 is equal to 0 and f prime of x does not change sign at x equals 2, we know that 2 comma negative 16 is an inflection point. So what do I mean that the first derivative doesn't change sign at, negative at 2? Well, here's 2, right? Our first derivative between 0 and 3 is always negative. It only changes sign at 3 from negative to positive. So had it changed sign from negative to positive at 2, then that would tell us that it's not an inflection point, that it's actually a minimum or a maximum. Most people like the first explanation that we did, where you can see that it changes concavity, because that's the definition of an inflection point, as a way to explain it. It is an inflection point, according to the second rule, right? According to the second rule, it changes concavity. According to the first rule, does it change sign? No, it goes from negative to negative again. So it is an inflection point because the first derivative doesn't change sign at 0 because it stays going from negative to negative at 0. Now, as far as what do we all have happening here? So we've answered the question. But if we wanted to graph it and go further on this question, what have we all figured out? We figured out two points are inflection points. We figured out two points that are stationary points, right? This 0 is a stationary point of inflection, and the 3 is a local minimum. So if we plug those two values into our original equation, we'd have 0 comma 0. as a stationary point of inflection, and 3 comma, what is that, 3 comma negative 27 as a local minimum. We know where our graph is decreasing and increasing. And we know where it changes as an inflection point. So now, if we wanted to graph this, what we're going to put on our graph are these key points. So 0, 0, 3, comma, negative 7, negative 27. I'm going to just estimate that to be down here. And 2 comma negative 16, so if this is negative 27, you okay with 2 comma negative 16 being about there? 
looking at our original function being x to the 4 minus 4x cubed. Can you see that if you wanted to, you could have factored out an x to the cubed out of here? And if you wanted to find your x-intercepts, well, you would know that 0 is one of them, but 4 will be another x-intercept. So what does our graph look like? According to our first derivative, it's decreasing until we get to 3, negative 27. So it's going to be going down all the way until we get to 3, negative 27. According to our second derivative test, we know that it's concave up, left of 0, concave down from 0 to 2, and then concave up again from 2 till infinity. So as far as graphing that goes, what I like to do is I like to start from my inflection points when I'm graphing. And I know from 0 to negative infinity it's concave up, so I start here and I draw that concave up. Then I know from 0 to 2 is concave down, so I start at 0 and 2 and draw a concave down you're going to get a really nice stationary point of inflection there if you draw it that way. And then from 2 to infinity, it's concave up again. So now I can just go through the points that I have left and draw the rest of my graph. So I've got concave up, then concave down, then concave up again. I've got my minimum at 3, negative 27. I've got my two inflection points at 0, 0, and 2, negative 16. And I also found an x-intercept because it was easy to factor my original function. So if I wanted to graph this, now I have a really accurate graph. Not only do I have my minimums and my maximums, my x-intercepts, but I also can show where my graph changes from being curved upwards or concave up or concave down. So this is a question that's saying, do all of those things. Sketch the graph. Find all your stationary points. Find all your inflection points. And graph it. Do you want to do this one together? OK. So you're going to do your first derivative. You're going to do your second derivative. You're going to see if you can find any x-intercepts and y-intercepts. Sometimes they'll be easy. Sometimes they'll be not so easy. For this one, to find your x-intercepts by plugging in 0 for y, this one doesn't look like it would be easy to factor. Possibly you could factor it with synthetic division and all that kind of stuff. But at this point, we'll go, yeah, maybe not worth it. Let's just figure out our first derivative, find our stationary point, then go to our second derivative, find our inflection point, probably can find a y-intercept easy by plugging in 0 for x, and then we'll draw our graph. So our first derivative. Three x squared minus six x minus nine. Set it equal to zero. You can probably see you can factor out a common factor of three. And then this factors nicely. So we get x equals 3 and x equals minus 1 as possibilities for our stationary points. When we put those into our sign diagram, minus 1 first, then 3, check a value less than minus 1. This will be negative. This will be negative means that our original graph had to be increasing less than negative 1. Between negative 1 and 3, if you plug in 0, this is still negative, but now this is positive, meaning that this will be decreasing. And finally, after 3, they'll, both of those factors will be positive, and so it'll be increasing again. So we know that 
negative one comma something will be a local max. You can see that already. And we know that three comma something is going to be a local min. How do I find the y coordinates of those? What do I plug it back into? The original function. So when I plug that back into my original function, negative one, negative four, plus nine, five plus one is six. Negative one comma six. 27 minus 27 is zero, minus 27 plus one minus 26. Pending any mental math errors. So now we have our local min and our local max. Now right beside this, find our second derivative so we can find any inflection points. This will be 6x minus 6. Set that equal to 0. And we get x equals 1 as a possibility for an inflection point. To find out if it actually is an inflection point, we're going to have to plug things in. Yes? Sure. So. Solving this, you could have also done it this way, right? Factored out the 6 and see that x is equal to 1 that way too. If it was 6x times x minus 1, it would be 0 and 1, but it's just a 6. So if you split it here, this one's never equal to 0, but that one's equal to 1. Yes. So now if we plug something in less than 1, what are we going to get? We're going to get a negative. This part is concave down. If we plug something in bigger than 1, again, now when we're checking concavity, we're plugging into our second derivative. When you plug in something larger than 1, you're going to get positive, so this is concave up. So we know that since it's equal to zero and it changes concavity, that that will be an inflection point. You could also see that at one, on our first derivative, it's still negative, right? So using that rule that it's not switching from negative to positive in our first derivative, that we know it's an inflection point. Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to go past the second derivative. Second derivative will be as far as you'll go as, fi as far as finding your inflection points. But we'll be able to do some x to the 4 ones after this. So now we can take all this information. By the way, we can write 1 comma. If we plug in 1 into our original equation, 1 minus 3 is negative 2 minus 9. Negative 11 plus 1 is negative 10. So we now know that 1, negative 10 is an inflection point. Okay? So as far as graphing this goes, plugging in all the values that we have. We've got negative 1, comma 6. I'm going to put 3 comma negative 26 on first just because it's my largest number to set a scale. So if that's 3 comma negative 26, negative 26 right there, where am I going to put negative 1 comma 6? That seem reasonable if I did it there? Again, I'm just trying to somewhat get an appropriate scale. Yes. And if it's positive 6, then I for sure wouldn't put it there, right? Thank you. I would move it. How about there? Whew. Very nice. Negative 1, positive 6. And then 1, negative 10. 
negative 10, maybe about there. Notice that we have no x-intercepts or y-intercepts here. A y-intercept is easy to find. How do you find a y-intercept? Plug in 0 for x. If we plug in 0 for x in our original function, you get a y-intercept of 1, right? So we can put, we could put that on here as well. And finding our x-intercepts would mean factoring that cubic, which we decided wasn't going to be super easy. So as now, as far as finding and graphing this, again, I like to start from my inflection point. So my inflection point is here at 1, negative 10. I know everything to the left of it is concave down, so I just need to go through those points and draw a concave down. Everything to the right of it is going to be concave up. I just need to go through those points and make it concave up. And there's a picture of our graph. Not bad. And it really looks like these values, which are my x-intercepts, are not nice values. So in that case, if you wanted to find them, I'd suggest going to your graphing calculator to find them. But if this was a non-calculator question, this would be all you'd be required to show. All right. So this next one. Um, same idea. We're going to work through all of doing your first derivative first, finding out where our stationary points are. Do your second derivative next, find out where your inflection points are. Plug those values back into your original function to find the actual points, and then graph. So there's our first derivative. 4x cubed minus 4x. Factoring out a common factor and factoring it further, you're going to get three possible in, uh, stationary points. Looking at your sign diagram, sure enough, one of them's a max and the other two are local minimums. And if you plug those points back into your original function, there they are. So that's finding your local mins and your local maxims, your stationary points. I'll go back down for a second. Sure, sorry. So then if you find your second derivative, again, set that equal to 0. This is the reason this one would probably be a calculator question, because when you go to solve it, you get the square root of 1 third. In fact, when you take the square root of both sides, you get plus or minus the square root of 1 third. So the value isn't very nice to work with. Again, you can do your sine diagram here and find out that both of those are, in fact, inflection points. And if you plug those in, you actually get not bad numbers, square root of 1 third into the original equation and negative square root of one third into the original equation, you get negative five ninths both times. So technically, up to here, 
we could have done everything without our calculator. So now plugging those points into our equation, we would find our inflection points are labeled there in green. Our maxes and minimums are labeled in blue. And if we would have set our original equation equal to zero and factored it, we could have found our x-intercepts to be zero and plus or minus square root of two. So I know I did put calculator at the top of this question, but technically we could do all of this and all these calculations without our calculator. There's nothing that is really, really bad. The only thing that's hard is to do the square root of one third to the power of four. How would you do that? If you had to do, if you had to do the square root of one third, plug that back into your original equation and you had it to the power of four. Right? So let's, if you, if you had the square root of one third to the power of four, what does that mean? It means the square root of one over the square root of three times the square root of one over the square root of three times the square root of one over the square root of three times the square root of one over the square root of three. Can you see those will all be one? The square root of three times square root of three is just going to be three. So this will be three times three and you get one nut. So if you had to do that, you could. Yes? So to get those x-intercepts, I went back to my original equation right here on the right, and I say, well, how do I find x-intercepts? I make y equal to zero. Making y equal to zero, I factored out an x-squared, and that left me with x-squared minus two. So if Splitting it up there, well, either x is 0 or x squared minus 2 is 0. And if I did that, if x squared minus 2 is equal to 0, that means x squared is equal to 2. And then you could square root both sides to get plus or minus the square root of 2. Good question. So again, for graphing it, I would start at my inflection point. This part's concave up. This section's concave down, and then this section is concave up. Okay, next example. A little bit more complicated. The derivative won't be quite as nice. We are going to find our stationary points. We are going to find our inflection points first part it says find our x-intercepts and then we're going to graph this but we're only going to graph it this part here from 0 to 5 pi over 2 means we're only graphing it from 0 to 5 pi over 2 so one of the things that's going to happen when you're graphing something over an interval is you're going to have to know where it starts and where it ends so what would happen if I plugged in 0 what is this going to equal to? What's our starting point on this graph? What's cos of 0? 1. What's e to the 0? 1. So when x is 0, it's going to start at 0, 1. What's going to happen when you plug in 5 pi over 2? Mental math-wise, I would suggest doing the cos of 5 pi over 2 before doing e power of 5 pi, negative 5 pi over 2 first. Because cos of 5 pi over 2 is 0, and then you don't have to worry about e to the negative 5 pi over 2 and the mental math. So those are going to be our key points starting off. We have 0 comma 1 and 5 pi over 2 comma 0. Those are going to be our endpoints of our graph. So when we go to graph it, that's our starting point and our endpoint. Now part A, finding x-intercepts. How do we find x-intercepts? We make y equal to 0. So if you make y equal to 0, you get e to the negative x times cos of x. 
does it make sense that e to the negative x is never 0? Never 0. Do you remember what the graph of e to the x looks like? OK. So what would the negative do transformation-wise? What is e to the negative? F flips it which way, over the y or over the x? It's going to flip it over the y. The way to remember that is the negative is with the x value. And if you think of one of your x values becoming negative, that flips over the y-axis. So if I were to draw a graph of e to the negative x, it would look like this be an exponential function that would be going down. And remember, you have an asymptote at 0 because it never touches 0. Gets closer and closer to it, but never touches it. So as far as finding our x-intercepts are concerned, we only have to think about where cos of x is equal to 0. And from your unit circle, you know that that happens at pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. And since we're going all the way up to 5 pi over 2, we'd have to include that one as well. So we have three x-intercepts. We're going we're gonna to find the first two stationary points. In fact, there are only two stationary points between this. So again, we have to take our derivative. Now our derivative is going to have a product rule here. So part of our strategies earlier where we were factoring things to make things look in a certain way was to help us in questions like this. So once I do my product rule, so I kept cos the same. The derivative of e to the negative x is e to the negative x, and it has a chain rule, so you have to multiply by negative 1. Then I kept e to the negative x the same, and the derivative of cos x is negative sine x. I see that I have a negative e to the negative x in common in both of those, and I can factor that out. Yes? The negative 1 is because when I have e to the negative x, and I want to do the derivative of that, the derivative of e to the x stays the same. So the first thing you do is keep things the same. But then you have to look, is this a chain rule? Because inside the function is a negative x. What's the derivative of negative x? Negative 1. So that's where this extra negative 1 comes from. So then you can factor out a ne negative e to the negative x. And you're left with this, we already talked about, is never equal to 0. We just have to figure out where cos x plus sine x is equal to 0. In other words, we're wondering, when is cos x equal to negative sine x? So here you can work a little bit with identities. Perhaps you could think of your unit circle and say, I know where cos and sine are the same. And so I know where cos is equal to negative sine. But if you rearrange this, cos equals negative sine x, by dividing both sides by cos, you get 1 is equal to negative sine x over cos x, and sine x over cos x is equal to tan. So this basically becomes tan x is equal to negative 1. Think about your unit circle. Where is tan x negative? Quadrant 2 and quadrant 4. And where is it equal to 1? That's a pi over 4 family. So you're going to have 3 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4. So then we could draw our diagram and find out that from, from 0 to 3 pi over 4, it's decreasing. From 3 pi over 4 to 7 pi over 4, it's increasing. And then after, it's decreasing again. Now, to actually find those points, when you plug in 3 pi over 4, you will need a calculator. Because yes, e to the negative 3 pi over 4 is not something you can do in your head. So I've already plugged those in. And you get your local min at 3 pi over 4 comma negative 0 0.067. And your local max happens at 0 0.0029. This question would be on the exam as a calculator question. Because there's no way you could figure out these 
without your calculator if you wanted actual point values. Okay? In university, sometimes what they'll do is they will get you to leave it as 3 pi over 4, because you could have got that without your calculator. And then when you plug in 3 pi over 4 into your original equation, what do you get? You get a, e to the negative 3 pi over 4 times, well, cos of 3 pi over 4. That you could do. That's negative root 2 over 2. So you could leave your y coordinate as negative root 2 over 2 e to the negative 3 pi over 4. And that's how you would leave your answer if you didn't have a calculator. Because that's as much as you could calculate without your calculator. But as far as graphing that goes, how good are you at estimating that negative root 2, or sorry, root 2 e to the negative 3 pi over 4 over 2 is approximately negative 0 0.067? No, not going to happen, right? Oh yeah, there is a negative out here. So we'll erase this. We'll say yes, you are allowed your calculator. Those are your two points. Because you're allowed your calculator, you could have also maybe found your maximum and your minimum with your graphing calculator. But this one is designed so it would be hard to get your window to find those. So it still might be easier using the calculus. As far as what does our final graph look like then, we can label 0, 1 as our start point. 5 pi over 2, 0 as our end point. Pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 were our other x-intercepts. We can label our max and our min, although they're very hard to see because they're so close to our x-axis. And no, yeah, I am bad at drawing, but that, to actually put 0 0.0029 on a graph, if this is 1, where is 0 0.0029? It's really, really close to your x-axis, and that's the maximum between this x-intercept and that x-intercept. So it gets a little tricky. Would I ask you one that's this fine on an exam? I think I'd be nicer than that. But depends how nice you are to me from now till the end of the year. Yes, I do make the exam. All right, there's five minutes left. I will get you to try this one on your own. So first of all, if you wanted to find your y-intercept, that would be easy. You could plug in 0 for x. Doing your first derivative. You should have got x equals 4 and x equals negative 2 as stationary points, and then found out that one of them was a local max and one of them was a local min. And then your second derivative, you get 1, negative 31 as your inflection point. So now that you have all that information, there would be your final graph. I included the x-intercept, 0, negative 5 on there. But that one I found via my calculator. Scroll back up for a second to there. <laughs> 